Um, welcome um, tonight to our presentation. My name is Helen Forrest and I'm a representative of the Arts and Culture Council. And uh, we work with the library to curate art exhibits and to facilitate programming of cultural events, et cetera. As some of you know, this presentation was to take place a week ago, Tuesday. And due to a power outage, uh, we were not able to fulfill that uh, event. So here we are again this evening. So some of you will have heard this um, information before. So just bear with me. A few housekeeping uh, details. Um, right now, everything is virtual at the library other than curbside pickup. So there is a fairly new exhibit that went up a week and a half ago called the Imagination Studio. These are um, students of Ashley Green, they're uh, children, and uh, they have painted their um, pictures uh, in oil um, in the medium and they're quite lovely. So if you have a chance to go on the website and look, I think you'll enjoy it. Stu Hiltz is going to be presenting in early May um, a presentation on wildflowers in Gray County. Some of you may have heard Stu present um, on waterfalls in Gray County. So uh, keep tuned to uh, find a date for that. We don't have that set yet. And we also want you to be aware that there is a juried art show coming up in July and August, and you can register online for that up until the end of April. So you may want to uh, consider uh, entering that. And uh, the best way to keep in touch of changes and opportunities and exhibits would be to sign up for the library newsletter if you haven't already, and to look at the events calendar on the website. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Lee Bartell, who will present Music as Sound and its effects on blood, bone, and brain. Lee was a professor at the Faculty of Music and Rehabilitation Science Institute at the University of Toronto. He is the former Dean of Research and founding director of the Music and Health Research Laboratory, again at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Music. Lee has a broad interest in music and a special interest in application of music in health conditions of the aging. He has reinvented himself a number of times from a beekeeper to professional musician to music designer to high school teacher and perhaps he will share some of his many other endeavors in his talk tonight. Uh, tonight Lee is going to concentrate on a model of response to music and pulse stimulation and clinical research and how this applies to the treatment of disease. On a personal note, Lee and his wife, Linda Cameron, have been a part of the Duncan, Kimberley and Union communities for the last 22 years, uh, escaping to Florida in the wintertime. And so they're here uh, tonight with us. And Lee, we're very pleased that you have agreed to talk. Thank you very much and welcome. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, having me, uh, for inviting me. Library Association uh, is, is uh, valuable. Uh, uh, makes a valuable contribution to the community, and this is certainly uh, one of them. And so um, I'm hoping, of course, that the power will not go out. I was a one minute in or so last week when everything went black. Uh, and so uh, we are looking forward to being able to actually get through some of the uh, strange and uh, weird ideas that I'm going to try to present uh, tonight. So as uh, Helen mentioned, my topic is uh, the... Uh, let me do a share. Music is sound and its effect on blood, bone, and brain. Of course, selected those because they, it is alliteration. There are other topics that I might bring into this, but uh, that, that'll do sort of for a start. And so uh, let me focus right in immediately on what we all, of course, think about when we think about music. That is, music has power. It, it changes how we feel, it can change uh, many aspects in, in how we experience our life. And of course, an old classic story is the one of uh, King Saul and David, the young David who uh, was uh, su summoned to the court of Saul with his harp when Saul was having uh, rather a bad day. Saul had was beset by an evil spirit, supposedly. I think he was uh, suffering from great guilt and anxiety over some of the bad things he had done. And when David played the harp, 
the spirit, the evil spirit left him. Sort of the first example in the Bible of music therapy. Uh, we have many practitioners of harp therapy uh, these days, and uh, they would probably uh, understand the effect very well. Um, you probably have heard the story or seen the video, the five minute video or so of Henry and the iPod. <clears throat> this is the gentleman who is sitting in a nursing home looking very despondent. And somebody puts earphones on his head and they play some of his favorite music from his youth, Cab Calloway, and his eyes pop open and he becomes animated and engaged. That sort of unleashed a whole uh, series of uh, things like the a film Alive Inside and the program in nursing homes called uh, Music Memory and uh, other uh, that has now transmuted another time into another program. Uh, and so it, it's, it's definitely powerful in the sense that we often see it uh, taking place. You may know the story in the book Allison's Brain of Allison Waiwata from Ottawa, who some years ago, she was a piano teacher and had a aneurysm in the brain and lost her words, her ability to speak and a lot of other functions. And Cheryl Jones, who uh, was one of our uh, PhD students at the Faculty of Music at U of T, a music therapist, uh, used neurologic music therapy approaches to uh, rehabilitate her brain function and bring back her ability to speak. And then in the stories, I have to include my wife who is sitting in the room uh, as my audience of one here who can uh, laugh at me or uh, at my jokes or <laughs> remind me of things. Uh, this past uh, fall had uh, some cardio issues, cardiac issues. And uh, she found that when she used low frequency sound and music that it reduced her blood pressure and in fact seemed to ease uh, some of the symptoms of uh, uh, having a heart attack, which probably wasn't a good thing. We should have gone to the hospital. Instead, she reduced the or removed the, the symptoms. And we thought, oh, see, that's looked after. And she ended up having a triple bypass surgery and then used low frequency vibration as a means to uh, keep the blood uh, stimulated and flowing and to help bone healing. Uh, and I'll talk about some of the mechanisms for that as it comes up. So the question is all these sorts of different effects of music, are they part of the magical power of music or what might be behind it? And I would argue that we now scientifically understand the mechanisms of response to music. And you see in this inverted triangle, this pyramid, uh, the most dominant response that we have and the one we most commonly associate with music is one that's sort of a learned cognitive response. It's analytical or emotional or associative, and most cleanly or easily seen in uh, the effect we have when we hear the national anthem and we, uh, we, we are moved into a feeling of patriotic, uh, um, uh, patriotism, or when we're at a wedding and the dance music moves us onto the dance floor, or we're at a, at a funeral and the music, you know, stimulates tears and so on. And it's, it's a response that we have learned by association. It's sort of our song uh, that we have experienced at one point, we made association with it. And when we hear it again, it brings back those memories. This can be a very deep as an isomorphic and primal. That is, we learn many things about music before we met, remember, uh, and this starts already in the womb. We know now that babies listen and hear while in the womb and can in fact learn certain music and recognize it after they're born and respond to it. So that's the most common. And then the next level of cognitive activation of neural circuits is the level at which uh, Allison, Allison's brain uh, was, was treated with, with music to activate very specific circuits in the brain that would lead to her uh, lexicon of words and allow that connection to be made. And we now know how that kind of a circuit connection works and it applies to many things that follow uh, people having a stroke. It can apply for people who have Parkinson's and people who develop the skills in using music specifically to activate circuits. 
uh, can then uh, work with these people. <clears throat> Another uh, level is this, uh, the, the bottom of the triangle, the cellular genetic response. And that's mainly what my interest is now and what I'll be talking about in the rest of this talk. It's at the level at which we don't need to listen to the music or even understand it or make connections or pay attention. It happens automatically and it happens because there is more to music than music. And this is the difficult pivot in many people's minds. This is the one that's hard to wrap your head around because we tend to think music is the melody and the rhythm and the harmony and the emotions we feel and so on. And what I'm interested in is the level that you see here where sound is rhythmic vibration. Yes, that vibrating string may well be making a sound, but it is a vibrating object. It can be a vibrating membrane. It can be a vibrating piece of wood as in a xylophone or lips as in a trumpet player or a reed as in a clarinet, but something vibrates in that way in order to make sound. And so sound becomes then uh, what we hear in this music. So you're not hearing music, but you're also experiencing molecular compressions that are going through the air and hitting your eardrums. And the eardrum translates that molecular compression, regular compression at various frequencies into electric signals or into uh, something that flows in this sort of way. The sound turn goes to the ear or it can go to the skin where we might feel it as vibration. In the ear, the hair cells and the cochlea are activated. In the skin, we have a variety of mechanoreceptors that are activated when we, uh, that's how we feel vibration. The hair cells in the cochlea connect to the auditory nerve cells, which then, or the mechanoreceptors to the spinal cord, which leads to brain cells. So when you hear a click like this, something is firing in the brain. It has quite a path and I can't unpack that uh, complex set of mechanisms that goes from sound to brain where you actually perceive it and know it. But in this single neuron, you see how it fires and it fires with that kind of a stimulant. So the effect of the sound waves on the body affects us generally and specifically. It can affect us in general on the body and more specifically on the blood, bone and brain as we experience it in these ways. So this might Waste be an example. Stubborn belly fat, metal vibration therapy. <laughs> So that's probably not what I'm talking about, though, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, about a month ago, a couple of guys from Germany, filmmakers, contacted me and wanted to have a Zoom meeting to discuss their project, which was to make a film about people who actually go and stand in front of very large rock music speakers for the purposes of feeling that vibration in their body. Uh, so uh, it's not unlike this, but, uh, you know, they, 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 they obviously have a different purpose for it, which they're trying to unpack in this movie and we're looking for a more specific, specific medical application. Uh, so it may shake away body fat, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna stand by that one. But I know what it does, that is when you shake the body with sound or with you know, strong vibration, it can have an effect on uh, the lungs and congested uh, phlegm in the lungs and COPD and emphysema and cystic fibrosis. And so in a sense, this mechanical shaking of the body can in fact be used as a treatment. And uh, the same applies uh, for the, the digestive tract. We did uh, a study, several studies with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, people who have a collagen deficiency in their, or problem, it's not a deficiency, they usually have too much and they're too, too flexible. And they often have digestive problems. And we found that using low frequency sound, in fact, helped those problems. And so uh, this, this sort of sense of 
music with low frequency shaking the body can be applied medicinally in various ways. But remember, most everything I'm talking about here tonight is about low frequency sound. That is between about the hearing level of 16 to 20 hertz. That's sort of the lowest sound we can hear. The lowest note on the piano is 27.5 hertz. That is that many molecular compressions per second coming at your ear or vibrations in the, in the, you know, the surface that you're feeling. Uh, up to about 135, in some cases we're going up to 200 uh, hertz, but typically it's in that sort of 20 to 100 uh, hertz frequency. So the low end of the, of the piano range, the low end of the bass guitar range, that's the frequency where we find the body responds to this kind of frequency or to vibration. And it means also that we therefore need something to translate that sound into a vibrotactile so you can sense it and feel it uh, effect. And so the, those devices are, can be these gigantic speakers like you just saw, but it is better done with more subtle transducers or vibroacoustic devices. You'll see one shortly. But one example, a novel device that's used for shaking up a lung phlegm and so on is this lung flute. People blow into it and it creates a vibration. Uh, let me see if my mouse will work and you'll be able to see it along this here. And that makes a low frequency a pulse, which then pushes back down the tube into the lungs and shakes up the phlegm in the lungs and people can cough it out better. So it's an FDA uh, cleared medical device for uh, shaking up phlegm in the lungs. This is the device that we use in research. So it is a chair topper. It has a, a, a low frequency transducer or like a subwoofer here and two speakers for music. And you sit against it. So you have your, your head against this and your back feels that vibration. So that's another way to, to specifically transfer this. So let's get at the blood effects, the hemodynamic effects. And I'll throw a couple of screens on occasionally here called specific mechanisms there just designed for the really keen to say, yes, we do understand why this stuff works, why these, these vibrations and how they make effects, but I'm not gonna belabor them. The vibropercussion that dissolves blood clots is similar to the vibropercussion that dissolves phlegm, but when applied in the blood, uh, it can in fact have a, have a effect. One of my colleagues right now is doing a study in Los Angeles with uh, rabbits and uh, specifically inducing blood clots in the brain and then using the sound vibration, which then not, it doesn't take very long in fact, to dissolve those blood clots and uh, remove them. Um, and uh, you know, we'll talk more about the stimulation of endothelial cells in a minute. So one of the applications of this sort of thing is uh, possibly in COVID-19. Uh, I actually have a study that's starting right about now. Um, we just have had uh, approval from Baycrest Hospital to start on the project. And one of the uh, studies that was key on this uh, last August was done in Sweden that showed that one of the more effective therapeutics against the COVID virus was nitric oxide, but nitric oxide is not very easily applied to people as medicine. But we know that when we vibrate the body, and this can be at a pretty slow rate, as in if you go running, your, your feet hitting the ground shakes up your body, that would be at about three, four, five times a second, to uh, we know in the area of 30 to 100 hertz uh, has this effect, stimulates the lining of blood vessels, the endothelial lining, and releases nitric oxide. And so potentially there's a strong effect. What we're looking at is the effect of uh, the cognitive decline that follows having COVID. And we will try to uh, use vibratory sound uh, along with the endothelial nitric oxide release and other brain factors uh, to see whether there may be a rehabilitative effect on this cognitive decline. So that's starting now. If you know people who have had COVID, who are been hospitalized or who had COVID tested positive, were not hospitalized, 
we'd be happy to uh, have them volunteer for the study if they have experienced some cognitive effect, brain fog, memory problems, etc. We know it can be applied very directly to blood pressure so that within 15 minutes of sitting on this vibroacoustic device and listening to low frequency uh, sound stimulation within that uh, 30 to 60 hertz range, blood pressure drops to the upper number often by 15 points. So one of the things we warn people against participating in our studies is if they already have chronic low blood pressure, uh, probably don't participate. So this applies to circulatory deficiency like uh, that might stem from uh, diabetes or other situations. Another application is in stroke. As I already mentioned, it can help to uh, dissolve blood uh, clots, uh, which also applies in COVID potentially, um, but it can also help to stimulate uh, the brain in other ways, which I'll talk about later in the neurological effects. One of the interesting effects you would not probably anticipate at all is in the no reflow effect after uh, having a blockage in an artery and having that uh, re re removed with bypass or uh, with a stent particularly, uh, refractory angina, uh, and so on. So let me give you some uh, examples here. Dr. Uriash, who is a colleague in Miami, was uh, in training and then learning to install artificial hearts. And after they had implanted a whole batch of these, they discovered that one, some of these artificial hearts had a bad bearing. And so as the motor turned, the pump, that bearing was not functioning smoothly, so the heart had a vibration. And they thought, oh no, this will be a problem. And so they, uh, they uh, explored the, uh, let me just turn off my, there we go. Um, and so what they looked at was the, the outcomes of the people who had the defective heart versus the people who had the heart with a good bearing, that was the non-defective heart. And they found that, in fact, the people with the defective heart had better health outcomes than the people who had the heart that worked properly. And the only explanation for this was that the defective bearing was producing a vibration in the blood <clears throat> that was stimulating the blood flow because it was stimulating that endothelial lining and creating a better flow uh, in, the, in the artery after the surgery. This also then translated into experiments that, uh, that uh, Arkady uh, Uriash conducted, uh, the poor little rat on top with a vibrator on top of its back with Velcro. Uh, yes, we actually do this. Uh, and he's done a whole bunch of studies with rats wearing vibrators. Uh, or the bottom, which is hard to figure out, that's actually looking down on the chest of a man, his his uh, chin is over here and you see his arms. And so this is like a backpack size uh, vibrator. It's like a subwoofer speaker that gets placed on his chest and low frequency sound is played. I've supplied some uh, five or six um, music tracks that have low frequency sound to this experiment in Los Angeles that's uh, treating people who have had a stroke um, with this kind of a device to facilitate blood flow. Um, and one of the interesting effects from this, uh, I know this may be a bit confusing, but it's a cytokine array signal and look particularly at IL-6 and IL-10. IL-6 is a cytokine, uh, an inflammatory indicator that is involved in stimulating inflammation. And IL-10 is one that is an anti-inflammation cytokine. It reduces inflammation. So before the stimulation or the group that did not have the vibration, the, the sound vibration, you see higher IL-6 and lower IL-10. That's a bad thing. So they're having more inflammation and less to counter, counteract that, sorry. Whereas the group that had the vibration has less of the cytokine that is making more inflammation happen and has a lot more of the... Um, cytokine that is reducing inflammation. So you actually see how sound stimulation uh, was reducing this. Now, of course, this is rats. We assume uh, people's hearts might respond in a similar way or their cytokine profile. Uh, incidentally, uh, in our uh, COVID study, we are looking at 105 different cytokines 
uh, inflammatory markers for a full inflammatory profile to see how our sound stimulation might affect that. Uh, multiple musculoskeletal effects. Um, again, mechanisms um, uh, point just quickly to this one and that one, the promoting anabol anabolic processes. So when you apply vibration to the body, one of the things that it does is stimulate those little uh, cells, those um, critters, <laughs> those uh, processes that create osteoblasts, the creating formation of osteoblasts or de deposition is what you need to build more bone. And inhibiting catabolic processes is uh, the part that deteriorates the bone or the bone, the osteoclasts are reabsorbed. And so when you have too much of the resorption and not enough deposition, you will have bone loss, bone density loss, and you might be having osteoporosis. What we've seen is that when you stimulate the person with vibration, a sound vibration, you end up with um, improving the anabolic process that builds bone and stops the process that leaches away the bone. And so you end up with uh, a process of improving uh, the osteoporosis uh, situation. Um, we now have, there we go. So applications of this are in uh, osteoporosis, I've already mentioned. It applies in bone healing. So when you need to be adding bone to the, the break, uh, this will happen with vibration. Uh, it can also apply in low back pain, um, neck and shoulder pain, spinal alignment, but that's a different process. That was the last uh, slide here indicated the, the microRNA release, uh, the effect on spinal disc and ligaments. So let's move ahead to this slide and show you some MRI images of a 23-year-old male who had cervical multi-level disc bulges. So this is in the next, this is uh, of C1, 2, 3, 4. So you see at this point, if you can see my, let me just get a little pointer and red. Uh, so you see here the bulges that the disc is pushing on the spinal cord, causing great discomfort and uh, nerve response. This was September 2020. And so by February 2021, you notice that those bulges are pretty much completely gone. And in fact, if uh, an MRI person who read this points out that the discs have hydrated and are slightly fatter than they were here. In other words, there's uh, improved disc health. And you say, what does this come from? The person obviously wasn't just listening to music with his earphones. So it comes from this. KKT treatment is a highly sophisticated non-invasive treatment procedure that utilizes an individual's unique signature sound frequencies to address core spinal distortions and disturbances. Data is analyzed from patient x-rays, uploaded to the computer, and sent to the KKT device. Prior to initiating treatment, we observed three things. One, a very visible distortion pattern in the spine. Two, compromised blood flow in the arteries. And three, compromised nerve function from the body to the brain and back down the body. Upon activation of the KKT device, we begin to notice the gentle repositioning of the vertebrae. We also begin to see restoration of the structure of the back to its normal form, increased blood flow, and functional restoration of the very crucial central nervous system. These same sound waves resonate down the spine, and with close observation, one can see the movement across the middle and lower back and down the hip. We can also see how through the treatment process, the leg length is restored back to normal. Muscles, blood vessels, and neural communication is stimulated, initiating the body's self-healing process. So that was a, that, that probe that you see applies uh, sound frequencies that are between 50 and 80 hertz. So well within the range of uh, 
um, low musical instruments and uh, uh, and hearing. It's not below the hearing level at all. Normal, most normal speakers will will play that frequency, and so it is uh, rather an astounding effect. And part of it, as we know from research now, comes from how it activates uh, messenger RNA and hydrates discs and uh, acts in other ways around things like collagen, uh, et cetera. It's, it's rather complex and I can't explain it now, obviously. Neurological effects. We have a lot of mechanisms here. This has been my primary area of focus um, and everything from nerve stimulation that applies in things like CRIPS, uh, complex regional pain syndrome, cerebral palsy. Um, and uh, we were going to just start a study just as COVID hit us last year at Holland Bloorview, that's completely on hold, or vagal nerve stimulation uh, with effects in depression, et cetera. So, uh, and, and look at, at the pain related areas. I'll get back to these because I'll talk specifically about pain, um, clinical pain conditions. And the reason why they work may well be gait control um, or stimulating neurotransmitters, but more likely, and primary uh, is this one, the oscillatory coherence that supports connectivity and circuit function. And this applies to a variety of different uh, conditions, including neurogenic pain, neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so on, and frontal oscillatory asymmetry, which uh, applies in depression. So zeroing in on circuits, we have in the brain a variety and a whole, you know, a, a multitude of circuits Common are pain circuits, uh, cognition circuits that help us think, memory. Uh, so when the memory circuit doesn't work, you will have trouble with short-term memory. Long-term memory may last longer, obviously, but short-term memory may go quickly. Uh, when the motor circuit doesn't work, you may not be able to, to, to initiate or stop uh, movement, as in the case of Parkinson's. The shaking you can't stop, or you may have sort of a dyskinesia, may not be able to start moving. It may affect the uh, mood uh, limbic uh, system circuits so that uh, a person may have depression, uh, et cetera. So there's a variety of these. So one of the things we know is that the most responsive area frequency for neurons is 40 Hertz. That is when we stimulate neurons all over the brain at 40 Hertz, they sort of jump into action most willingly. And so it, is, uh, it has a, a particular um, role within the brain. What exactly that is, is still being unpacked. And it's not just exactly 40, it can be you know, 35 to 45. We use 40 Hertz sort of as a shorthand for a gamma. Um, and what we know is when circuits do not function right, bad things happen as I've already mentioned in uh, Parkinson's and so on. Fibromyalgia, uh, we think, is a condition that is uh, sort of neuro, basically neurogenic. It may have some body uh, cellular level uh, causes, but we do know there are circuit uh, malfunctions when people have fibromyalgia. And so our first study looked at 19 patients. This was an open label study. Our prescription was 23 minutes of sound at 40 hertz, two times a week for five weeks. So they came into the doctor's office, they laid down on a nice lounge that had uh, the transducers that played this low frequency sound. And uh, 23 minutes later, they got up and left the doctor's office two times a week for five weeks. And this is what we observed. So that in the baseline, the patients before, this is uh, before the treatment, were on the high end of the fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia impact quotient or questionnaire. After the five, after the treatment, they were clustering on the bottom end of the scale. Uh, it was a very dramatic effect for about a third went off all their medications. Um, there was improved um, sleep. There was decreased depression. Uh, people missed fewer days of work. Uh, people could stand and sit longer and so on. So it was, it was quite a dramatic result. So we did another study, a, a, more, a larger study, more controlled with a uh, uh, control trial. Uh, and again, 40 hertz sound for 30 minutes a day. 
applied with a different device, the, the, the one you just saw with the saw previously, it's sort of on a chair, the sound away says BTS 1000, five times a week for five weeks with 38 patients. And uh, so this is a device we used. And uh, we saw, again, very similar results. The treatment significantly reduced the fibromyalgia symptoms. And 52% of the patient's symptoms improved on average by 40%. So it's a pretty dramatic improvement that often, you know, we just haven't had it in use the last couple of weeks that uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen, paracetamol um, may in fact have no more effect than placebo effect. This is considerably stronger than placebo effect. <clears throat> Here's another uh, shot at that these at these uh, respond at these uh, subjects in this particular study, and you notice that we divided them here into the responders, those 52% that responded, and you see a very dramatic decrease in uh, the uh, the impact of the fibromyalgia. So the next study, which we're just starting now, uh, is at the Women's College of Baycrest, and we were going to look for 20 people with fibromyalgia and 10 healthy controls. And notice at the bottom in red, if you are interested or know of anyone interested in participating, uh, please contact me. We are uh, screening people uh, almost on a daily basis for people who might be involved in this. Um, and so we do have the go ahead, even with the current stay at home order lockdown to do research at Baycrest Hospital. So we would have people come in and we will do an EEG, uh, not an MEG scan of their brain. We will take a blood test to do a look at the cytokines and then uh, send them home with the uh, vibroacoustic device and they will treat themselves for uh, three weeks and then come back. Uh, we did this depression study, um, 19 participants, again with uh, this case with music and sound vibration. And uh, here we saw that over, these are the responders who had uh, more effect that from week one at 5.1 to week five, 6.2, their depression lifted, it got considerably better. Uh, this are the probabilities in case you're interested in the stats, you see on all the uh, depression, sleep index and quality of life, we had statistically significant improvement. <clears throat> Here's an interesting part of this that uh, this is not, you know, I sort of self-report or a placebo effect, what we were measuring was straight reaction time. When you see the right thing, hit the space bar. And in this case, we used a monetary incentive. That is when we paid, we, they, they got paid to, to get good results. And so what we saw is that the responders, those whose depression improved most, also got much better at faster at responding whereas those people who were not responding did get a bit better, but not as much as the others. In this case, with no incentive, they still got considerably better, uh, but you know, not quite as, as fast as uh, with, mo so, uh, with the monetary incentive. So when you pay them, people do respond faster. They, they just <laughs> try harder. Um, some years ago, uh, we I met a, a woman who had been diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's and uh, she had uh, been diagnosed, I guess, in June or July. And uh, that fall, um, she came to us and uh, we had, and, and sort of enrolled her in a bit of a pilot study treatment. And so we put her on a chair and applied 40 hertz vibratory stimulation uh, a couple of times a week, three times a week for four weeks, so 12 sessions. And we saw that her memory improved. She could remember the names of her grandchildren better. Uh, she seemed more clear about what was going on around. And she then wanted to continue this, so I gave her the portable device to continue, not with the same you know, in-depth track, but uh, something that gave her some 40 hertz stimulation. Met her about a, well, met her husband about a year later, and he said she loved using the device. She continued to use it, and he didn't think there was any deterioration in her, which in, for Parkinson or for Alzheimer's is always a good sign. Another year later, we met her at a rather busy 
cocktail party, people standing around a room, large room, noisy, therefore with about 150 people. And she was in our group that was uh, carrying on a conversation and she was participating, talking about golf in the summertime. This meeting was happening in about October. And so I thought to myself, I need to bring this woman back in and retest her with the same tests we used to see whether she, her uh, Alzheimer's has progressed. And so they volunteered to come back in and to be used as a case. We requisitioned all our medical records. And we found indeed that from then almost three years earlier to that point, she had not deteriorated in her MMSE score at all. It was identical to when she was first tested as mild Alzheimer's. Um, so we've written that up and published that as a case uh, account in uh, Alzheimer's uh, or in a music medicine journal. Like Here's another study that uh, we did. Could improve the brain function of those with dementia. A provocative theory that's now being tested on patients. Oh, beautiful with some pretty intriguing early results. You theorize, and then when you see it in reality, it is, wow. Studies suggest that our brain cells talk to each other at a frequency of 40 hertz. That's like a low E on a piano. But in those with Alzheimer's and dementia, that frequency seems to be disrupted, possibly contributing to the forgetfulness and memory loss. So scientists are trying to normalize brain communications with what they call sensory stimulation. Built into these chairs are speakers that vibrate at, you got it, 40 hertz. And so in a sense, it's like sitting on a subwoofer of your sound system so that you're getting both the, the sound and the feeling of the vibration, which uh, in turn is communicated through the, the cells of the body. In their first just published study, Researchers found Alzheimer's patients given 12 treatments in the chair improved. Do you know what city we're in today? Oh yes, Toronto. Increased clarity um, and cognition, as well as an increased alertness to the surroundings. And we also saw that it prompted spontaneous discussion, storytelling, and reminiscence. And the strongest effect was in those with mild and moderate Alzheimer's. In the broader scale, if, even if we could halt the rapidity or you know the the decline that would already be a great achievement and i think that is completely realistic so many questions say scientists who think they now may be sitting on a potentially new way to stimulate the mind <laughs> avis favreau ctv news toronto one of the things uh avis avis favreau got wrong was that it was not 12 treatments it was actually only six um, we had that effect. So this is the details in the study, 18 patients, six mild, six medium, six severe, uh, and a random crossover, uh, 30 minutes of 40 hertz, two times a week for three weeks in this kind of a chair that has uh, subwoofer speakers built in, as you can see. And uh, these are the results that over on the, on the left-hand side, that on a per session basis, that every session saw an improvement and, and a sort of a cumulative effect that uh, raised uh, the performance on the cognitive test by about 13%. Uh, the DVD watching nice ocean waves and so on actually made them worse. Uh, I think they got bored. Uh, here's some interesting research which points at the mechanism that we used. Um, it was done at MIT. And what they were doing was using Alzheimer's mice, not uh, people. Um, and what they did for the first trial, this was as ours was going on with sound, they were doing this with light. And so they took mice, five XFDAD mice, mice that are specifically bred to develop Alzheimer's at three months of age by development of amyloid beta in their brain. And they focused on gamma neural activity, sort of in that 40 hertz zone. And what they found is that gamma, not just in AD mice, but in people, so that people who have um, Alzheimer's, you see how much lower this whole scan is compared to the control, it's higher. In other words, the people who have Alzheimer's have less active activity or response at the 40 hertz level. The gamma activity has deteriorated according to this research. And they found the same in the mice. Uh, and so they uh, applied the 40 hertz signal and they got um, an improvement, but 
we have to look at the specifics of that. So they, you, when you develop Alzheimer's, of course, there's cognitive impairment, there's amyloid plaques, there's neurofibrillary tau tangles, another protein, uh, structural abnormalities, the brain shrinks, uh, there's loss of synapse, and there's neuroinflammation. Uh, one of the key issues here is that this red line, which is the increase in the amyloid beta, which is one of the strongest suspected correlates of developing Alzheimer's, increases a long time before the clinical signs of it develop. So the blue line here is when you start to see your memory loss being affected, this starts to build up ahead of time. So ideally, we would be reducing the amyloid beta and drug companies have tried for years and basically two years ago gave up. Pfizer was the last company to give up on their drug trials. Um, there's some efforts now to maybe enhance that by using uh, pulse stimulation on the brain, but at this point their drugs have failed. So this research is therefore encouraging. The amyloid beta plaques are the target. So these mice were treated with a flicker of 40 hertz. So they're sitting in their nice little tub. There's 40 hertz light around them, the lights flicker. And they did this for an hour a day for seven days. And what they found is that these mice had a reduction in anxiety levels. They improved their memory of places. In other words, they could run through the maze better again and find their cheese. They could recognize objects more easily. They locate objects more easily. They had no um, change in body weight and other kinds of things. There were no adverse effects for several weeks. And here's the big surprise. The, Rhythmic sensory stimulation, in this case, visual stimulation, reduced the amyloid beta most at 40 hertz flicker. At 20 hertz, it actually went up. And at uh, from this is where there's no light, the black one. And so you have a serious reduction when you stimulate the brain at 40 hertz. Um, and the question is, why are the amyloid levels lower? Well, what happens is that the uh, amyloid is naturally released from neurons. And when there is gamma flicker, microglia are activated and they go and munch up the uh, amyloid beta and clean it up. The microglia are like the little janitors that are supposed to go around and clean up the brain. But as Alzheimer's sets in, they become lazy and they just sit around. So pulsation of the light flicker or auditory flicker or vibrotactile flicker activates them. They also saw a significant reduction in the um, inflammation. There's an increase in immune cells. They saw an increase in the size of blood vessels. And they have since then looked at uh, sound, which is what we were doing, and found that when you combine the two, you have, in fact, the most potent treatment, uh, but of the two, sound is the more effective. And so uh, that uh, they're currently working on uh, some commercialization of this and uh, FDA approval. And so uh, we've tried to look at some of that. Uh, this is now sort of, uh, you know, a wish, wishful uh, thinking. Uh, we had started a study at the Glebe Center in Ottawa that was going to compare 40 hertz sound and vibrotactile with some other uses of music, but that's currently on hold due to COVID. Uh, so that's the Sound Oasis VTS that delivers this. And uh, I'll just zip through this at this point and suggest that if you have questions about that or other things later, you can contact me at this email. Lee, on behalf of the Arts and Culture Council, I want to thank you for a very informative presentation. I think for many of us, this is fairly new territory, uh, but is of interest in many ways. And in particular, I think it inspires hope for some of us with some of these diseases of aging. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us. And uh, thank you for sharing your ongoing research. Perhaps the upside of COVID is that we've been able to engage you tonight to speak at the library. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's been a privilege.